Okay, great. Uh, so today we're ha very happy to have Mark Van Ramstein from UBC. He's going to tell us about microscopic models of Big Bang cosmology. Please go okay. ahead. So the word towards is very important here, but um, I'm going to talk about some work that was done a couple of years ago and then various follow-up uh, related papers more recently and then some work in progress. And so I thought I would start the talk with one of these report cards that you see in, in some talks, except this is like the elementary school version of the report card. So there's, there's no A's or, or B's or C's that would make people feel bad. Um, the, at least this is how it was for my kids in elementary school. You, you have the, the student does not yet meet expectations, which means that you should be probably very concerned and look into it. And the other option is the student generally meets expectations. And that means that you have nothing to worry about and uh, that your child is making good progress. And so this is a report card for, for, for string theory or quantum gravity. And, uh, and, and the subjects are number one, the physics of black holes. And, and so we've been doing very well, especially with ADS EFT, understanding the physics of black holes in the last year, we've made progress in understanding the page curve and unitarity and so forth. Uh, so we get the check mark here. The other subject is cosmology and the Big Bang, which is another reason why, another main reason why we want to understand quantum gravity. And here, the check mark is in the other column. Um, so there, there have been some interesting ideas here and there, but I, I think overall, we're we're maybe not. Uh, we're, we still seem far off from having some microscopic model of of Big Bang cosmology or or um, or you know, whatever whatever cosmology um, describes our universe. It's, it's really not clear even what the kind of right mathematical framework is for describing that. So uh, I haven't spent a lot of time teaching in elementary schools, but I imagine that if you have a student that might be enthusiastic about reading, but not so good at math, well, maybe you could try having the student read a story about math. And so that's kind of the, the motivation for this talk is to try to make progress in this weaker area by using our strengths. Um, so here's the fantasy, here's the overall picture that I'm exploring in this talk. And the idea is to try to use the physics of black holes, some specific black hole state in order to come up with a model of cosmology, to actually embed cosmology into a black hole space-time. And so the way that this would work is that we start with some CFT. Let's say it's on S3 if we want to describe a, a closed universe, or it could be on R3. And I want to consider some high energy state of my system. So psi is something, uh, with an energy uh, that would correspond on the gravity side to a black hole spacetime. But this is some very particular pure state. And I'm going to see in more detail what kind of state I'm talking about. The idea is this state, it's, it's dual to a black hole. And so outside of the horizon, it's just the usual ADS Schwarzschild spacetime. But then past the horizon, it has a particular structure. And so what I've drawn here is it's like the Penrose diagram for the two-sided ADS black hole. But the interior of the space-time is cut off as you go past the black hole horizon by this end of the world brain. So this is just some kind of end of your space, which forms an inner boundary of the black hole. And if you restore the sphere, direc the sphere direction that's been suppressed in this Penrose diagram, then you see that what happens is that you have a, as a function of this world volume time, uh, you have a sphere that starts out with zero radius because it starts in the past, past singularity, expands and then contracts again when it enters the future horizon. Okay. So there's some FRW geometry. It's like an FRW big bang, big crunch geometry for this end of the world brain. Okay. So, Normally you wouldn't be very excited about that for cosmology because even though the geometry here is FRW, 
typically the gravitational physics would be higher dimensional. So this is, this is just a picture of the boundary of some higher dimensional space time. And so you wouldn't normally have say 40, if this is a 4D picture, you wouldn't have 4D gravity in this picture, it would be 5D gravity. But there's one situation where we could imagine that gravity actually localizes onto this end of the world brain. So this uses the physics of, uh, of Randall and Sundrum, who realized that if you have a brain that cuts off asymptotically ADS space, okay, so if this is, let's say this brain is far out towards, uh, like way past the horizon, so you can think of it as some cutoff version of the second asymptotic region. Okay. So in this situation, gravity can localize on such a brain. So we can have localized gravity if this end of the world brain is somehow far enough behind the horizon. Um, so it's like a plank, what, what's called a plank brain in the Randall syndrome literature. In this case, if we can realize this picture, we can have not only some geometry, which is an FRW cosmology, but actually localized gravity, at least for some significant amount of the cosmological evolution. And then the effective description of the physics here would be, for, would be some 4D cosmological physics. And so the new thing here, you know, people considered this kind of Randall syndrome cosmology a lot in the past, but the new thing here is that we would be able to be giving a microscopic description of the whole picture, because ultimately this whole space time should be described by this particular microstate in the CFT. And so in principle, if we had full power over the ADS CFT correspondence, and we could find a state with these properties, we could calculate, for example, the initial conditions that you would feed into the effective field theory description once, it, once it's well described by 4D um, effective field theory. Mark, are you saying that the state includes the information about the end of the world brain? Yeah, so this, this, this state um, should include full, in, this is some pure state of the CFT and should include full information about the dual space time. So including all of the dynamics that happens on the, on the end of the world brain. Now, it's a very difficult question in ADS CFT to probe local physics behind a black hole horizon, but I'm assuming that we could overcome that technical hurdle somehow. And I'll say more later in the talk how we could do that. I'm confused about the picture on the bottom right. Okay. So it looks like you're depicting a closed universe. Yeah. But if I pick a spatial slice, shouldn't it have some kind of a wormhole that connects it to the asymptotic region on the left in the figure above? Yeah. So what I'm drawing is just the intrinsic geometry of this end of the world brain. Ah, okay. And so I'm saying that in the higher dimensional picture, um, we have the graviton, so, so we have the, the higher dimensional graviton um, has a mode that localizes onto the end of the world brain and behaves as a 4D graviton. So this is kind of the, the now the bottom the picture bottom is like picture a, is some an kind effective of, field theory that, description. That's some effective field theory of the top picture. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what are, these, what are these states? Now I'm going to propose a particular kind of state that we could study that may have a geometry that looks like the one in the picture. And so the state that I'm going to talk about is constructed using a Euclidean path integral. So we're familiar with the idea that you could take the vacuum state and express it as e to the minus beta h acting on some reference state in the limit where beta goes to infinity. And then you could replace that Euclidean evolution with a path integral expression. And so we could draw this picture here where you have um, an infinite amount of Euclidean time evolution. Um, and this, this picture uh, gives you the wave function um, for the vacuum state. So, so more specifically, um, you know, the wave functional for some field configuration phi zero um, on the sphere is equal to, would be equal to the, this path integral. Um, the states I'm talking about are obtained by a similar construction, except that the Euclidean path integral now involves only a finite amount of Euclidean time evolution. And at this past Euclidean time, we introduce a boundary for this Euclidean CFT. So this boundary, it involves 
maybe a choice of boundary conditions for our bulk CFT fields, but it could also include some additional degrees of freedom that we couple in. These are degrees of freedom that we're not actually adding to the physical theory. We're, the, the theory that we're talking about, the Lorentzian theory that we're talking about is still the CFT on a sphere, um, but we're adding these degrees of freedom into the Euclidean path integral. Um, so they are involved in sort of producing the state of our Lorentzian CFT. So let me just be more clear. So what I'm gonna do is define the wave functional for a configuration of CFT fields on a sphere. And that is equal to the integral over all configurations of this higher dimensional Euclidean CFT with a boundary. So we integrate over all the bulk configurations here that have this value phi zero on the sphere at time equals zero. And then we're also integrating over these boundary degrees of freedom. And we weight that whole thing by this Euclidean action. Okay. So this is, this is a state which is fully specified by saying, what are the boundary conditions and boundary degrees of freedom here? Um, so what is this BCFT? And how much Euclidean time evolution do we have here? So this is not a state uh, dual to some local operator. Yeah, it would be a state dual to some local op. So, if, so I could replace that. I mean, any state, of course, is dual to some local operator. Um, so I could, there'd be some, some kind of like OPE where let's map this thing to the disk. So this boundary is like a, now a hole in the disk. Um, but I should be able to expand the insertion of that boundary in terms of local operators if I want to. Well, it's, it's just more like it's more like what you would get if you took a D brain and you evolved in, in the closed string channel for some period of Euclidean time. So that's not dual to any local operator. It's dual to some Euclidean evolution of a of a D brain boundary state, which is really a coherent. I mean, you could well, decompose it on some collection of Ishibashi states, yeah. but it's a highly coherent state of those sort of things. Yeah. So I should say that I mean there is you could write it as maybe an infinite sum of local operators. So any state of the CFT is going to correspond to some local operator, but it wouldn't, it would be some horrible sum of, this is not an energy eigenstate. So it's not an operator of a fixed dimension. It would just be some horrible sum of very high dimensional operators. Right. So yeah, it's probably better to understand it in this other way where you, where you have, um, uh, just a boundary. We've introduced a simple boundary into the theory. So as, as ML said, it's like a, like a D brain. Okay. So I want to understand, um, so this is a state that I can define in the CFT. I want to understand the gravity picture. What is this state dual to? And so first I have to talk a little bit about how do we do ADS CFT when you add a boundary to your holographic theory? <coughs> So the basic picture was discussed in the past, first by Karch and Randall, later in some detail by Takianagi, and also by various other authors who discussed microscopic versions of this. So a rough picture is the following. We have a holographic CFT that would be dual to some asymptotically ADS spacetime. Now we sort of remove half of it, introduce a boundary, and possibly some boundary degrees of freedom here. And then there should be some analog in the bulk of, of cutting the CFT in half. And that's something that I'm going to call an end of the world brain. And so we have part of the ADS space time that we started with, and now that's cut off in some way. In the microscopic picture that I'll discuss later in the talk, this end of the world brain is not really a, a sort of a microscopic brain of the theory necessarily. It can just be a place where the internal dimensions degenerate somehow, and that degeneration could be smooth. So an example of one of these end of the world brains would be when you have a bubble of nothing space time, in the case with one extra dimension, um, the end of the world brain there, so the edge of the bubble is really a place where the extra dimension pinches off smoothly. So from the higher dimensional picture, you just have a smooth space time. But from the lower dimensional picture, you would describe that as there being an edge to your space time. So we can think of either 
using the microscopic picture and studying 10 dimensional solutions. I'll talk about that later in the talk. Or we could think of this bottom up picture where we have the lower dimensional gravity, an end of the world brain, and then we just introduce various terms in the action for that end of the world brain. So the most important term that we're going to talk about is the tension of this end of the world brain. And that's related to an important property of our boundary CFT. So this was work, um, this was sort of pointed out by Takinagi, um, who studied entanglement entropy for regions of this, say a, a hemispherical region of this CFT centered on the boundary. Um, there's some, there's some kind of universal expression um, for, for that in CFT. And, and then you could, he compared that CFT calculation to a calculation in gravity where you introduce an end of the world brain with some tension and then use the Ryu Takinagi formula to calculate the entropy. Okay, so there, was these, there were these two entropy calculations. You compare those and then what you learn is that the larger your tension here, um, the larger this angle becomes. So that's just when you solve the gravitational equations. And then the larger the, um, the area of this RT surface, it, and so the, the more holographic entanglement entropy you have. Um, and so basically the, the, um, the fact that you have more entropy indicates that you have more of these boundary degrees of freedom. So going the other way, the idea is if you have more boundary, if you have a boundary condition where you've coupled in more boundary degrees of freedom, then in order to, you know, you're going to get a larger entanglement entropy for a region, including the boundary. And in order to model that correctly in the bulk, um, it turns out that the right thing to do is to include a larger tension parameter. So that'll be important for us, just the connection that the tension of this end of the world brain is connected to the number of these boundary degrees of freedom. And geometrically, the larger tension means that the angle of this brain increases. So, um, Mark? We're, yeah, go ahead, Seth. Uh, sorry, so what was it in the original CFT state that fixed the tension? It's the, it's the number of, so it's, so starting with a bulk CFT, we have a choice of boundary physics. So we can choose some boundary conditions for our bulk CFT fields, and we can also couple extra degrees of freedom here. And so this theory here is characterized by a bulk central charge and a boundary central charge. And what I'm saying is that this boundary central charge um, is, is the thing that corresponds to this tension. You fix the choice of boundary conditions and then you still integrate over the fields on that boundary, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay, so, so for this talk, I'm sorry, going to sorry, be, so, oh yeah, so, go ahead. Um, so if I'm just a CFT person and I don't know anything about uh, ADS. Yeah. Um, what property, so is this red line supposed to be um, a some kind of conformal field theory that lives on the edge of a strip in um, so I'm just if I focus on yeah. you know so the one plus one dimensional CFT with a zero plus one dimensional boundary. Okay, yeah. Is this supposed to be some kind of a um, quantum mechanics that's describing um, some boundary conditions that I would put on that one plus yeah, one. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit easier to, th I mean, that, I think that one plus one dimensional case is special. In higher dimensions, you can think of there just being like a, th let's, we're going to be talking about 4D. So later I'll talk about N equals four super Yang Mills theory. We think of that on a half space. And then we just couple that thing to some super conformal three-dimensional theory. And you have a lot of choices there in order, in, in, in terms of what you could couple in there. Okay. So the red, the red thing is, it's, it's almost like a separate 
lower dimensional field theory that is coupled to your higher dimensional field theory at that place. Okay. Um, one interesting point is that if, the, if we look at the bottom up picture and we just take the tension to be approaching some critical tension, you find that the angle of this brain goes all the way to, to pi over two. And so actually there's this limit where it looks like the brain becomes one of these Randall syndrome Planck brains. So it looks like for, for tension um, close enough to some critical value, it doesn't have to go to infinity, there's just this critical value of the tension. Um, we could actually achieve uh, a Planck brain where gravity would be localized. And I'm gonna come back to this when we talk about a microscopic version. Okay, so our, our goal is that to understand the geometry dual to this state that we constructed using the path integral. And I'll just review quickly how we're going to do that. So we have our state. If I wanna calculate something in the CFT about that state, I would take this expression and insert some operators maybe on this dotted line. So that, that kind of expectation value would be computed by this CFT path integral with a boundary in the future Euclidean time and the past Euclidean time. And then if I wanted to use ADS CFT, I would say that this path integral could be computed by a gravity path integral. That would be dominated by some saddle point geometry. And so the calculation that we normally do is just find the solution of the bulk equations whose boundary geometry looks like this cylinder. And now we've understood that the boundaries of the cylinder will correspond to some bulk end of the world brain object. And we have actually two natural possibilities for the topology of that thing. We could either have a boundary that on the top that has its own connected end of the world brain and then a separate end of the world brain on the bottom. So this geometry would be like the ADS cylinder cut off on the top and the bottom somehow. But you could also have this geometry where the end of the world brain from the, from the uh, future boundary joins up with the end of the world brain from the past boundary. So you have a single connected component. Okay, so these are, these are the Euclidean geometries that I would use to calculate properties of this um, state. But we're interested in the, the, the Lorentzian geometry and so the way to get that is by some analytic continuation. And specifically what we can do is slice this geometry in half. It's, it's time symmetric by construction. Look at the fields on the time equals zero slice and use those as initial data for Lorentzian evolution. And so what you find is that in this case, you see that the slice at time equals zero is just a slice of pure ADS. And so the geometry, if this is the saddle point solution, is basically pure ADS. At the quantum level, it's going to have maybe some, some matter in there that doesn't back react. This is what we expect to get if this tau zero parameter is large. So it, if tau zero goes to infinity, we just get back the vacuum state of our CFT. And if tau zero is large enough, then the physics is similar to that vacuum state as dual to pure ADS with a few excitations. On the other hand, for small tau zero, we expect um, to get maybe a very high energy state. And that would be the, what corresponds to this case. So if we look at the time equals zero slice, which is shaded in green here, we find that there's an asymptotically ADS boundary. And then there's an inner boundary, which is our end of the world brain. If you actually do these calculations in some bottom up model and find the geometry of that slice, then it looks like a black hole. So the end of the world brain is actually past a horizon in the case where that tension, the tension of that thing is positive. So if we're in this phase, if this solution has the least action compared to these, comparing these two, then our time equals zero geometry in the Lorentzian picture is this black hole with an end of the world brain behind the horizon and then the full time evolution looks like the picture that I described before. Okay. So the bottom line is in order to realize specific states of a CFT that actually have this description, we can, we can use these path integral states. Now, one of the 
things that we wanted was for gravity to localize on that end of the world brain. Um, and so what we need, so let, let's, let me just draw this same picture in a different way. I'm going to suppress the, the sphere direction. Okay. So this is, this is now the Euclidean time. Um, and so the, I'm drawing the Euclidean picture. So this is a, a Euclidean Schwarzschild black hole. There's the horizon. Um, and we just have a finite amount of Euclidean time on the boundary. And then the end of the world brain goes from here to here. Um, so I'll just remind you that the tension parameter controls the angle at which this brain comes into the bulk. Um, so what can happen in principle for large tension parameter is that this angle can increase and then it would hug this, you know, what would be the second asymptotic region. This is, well, this is a Euclidean picture, but in the Lorentzian picture, um, it becomes the second asymptotic region. Okay, so, so the idea is we wanna come up with a state like this. And then if we choose a lot of boundary degrees of freedom down here, then that suggests that maybe the end of the world brain will be pushed far back behind the horizon enough so that gravity would localize. Okay, so that's, that's, our, that's our goal later when we're going to talk about microscopic states. So before I do that, let me talk about evidence from the CFT that all of what I'm saying here is, is correct. So I've just, used a simple bottom-up model with Einstein gravity and an end of the world brain with some tension and figured out what the geometries corresponding to these boundary conditions are. Um, I want to emphasize that we can actually do some CFT calculations that directly give evidence that this picture is correct for the geometry. Um, so these calculations that I presented in a paper with Jamie Sully and David Wakeham, they're mostly in 2D. So, so the next few slides are specifically for a 2D version of this story. Um, and so the calculations that you can do, so we start out with a CFT state constructed using the path integral. And the thing that we looked at was the entanglement entropy of a subsystem of the CFT. So this is now just a CFT on a circle. We look at the entanglement entropy of an interval and the prediction from the gravity picture that I just described is the following, that if the interval is small, you have an RT surface which is outside the horizon and some time independent entanglement entropy. But then as the RT surface gets large enough, um, you end up having, a, or as the sorry, interval gets large enough, you end up having an RT surface which goes all the way to the end of the world brain. And so the entanglement entropy, according to these gravity solutions, exhibits a phase transition. And on the large angle side of that phase transition, the RT surfaces are actually uh, probing this end of the world brain. And so you, you can, um, you know, you should be able to read off details about the geometry past the horizon by looking at the formula for the entanglement entropy. Okay. So, do we actually see this behavior if you, if you calculated entanglement entropy in a CFT for a state as I've described, do you actually see this behavior? Um, I mean, so this is the formula for gravity that we're, we're kind of trying to reproduce. And it turns out that you, you can in fact reproduce exactly this formula, um, including the phase transition using a CFT calculation um, with a few sort of standard assumptions. So the CFT calculation is just by using the, um, the replica trick to calculate the Renyi entropy. And so we would calculate the partition function on a multi-sheeted version of this cylinder where you glue it across the cut. And that maps to some calculation of the two-point function of twist operators on the cylinder. And then this phase transition that you see in the gravity picture, it turns out to um, correspond to a transition between like, the identity block in different channels dominating the calculation. <clears throat> so very similar to when you have the four point function um, and the vacuum block in one or the other channel dominates and you can get a, a phase transition um, depending on the locations of your operator insertions. 
here, this, this two point function of twist operators, um, we can expand it either in a bulk channel or in a boundary channel where you, where you um, expand each operator in terms of boundary operators. And then you have some identity being exchanged. Um, so you have these two different channels. And so assuming that you have the vacuum block in one or the other channel giving you the answer um, and that you just sort of choose the one um, that is smallest, you actually end up reproducing this calculation. So there's one other assumption um, in the CFT calculation. We also have to assume that the one point functions of operators of like scalar operators are small. Um, <clears throat> having non-zero one point functions would correspond to having other fields turned on in the, in the gravity side. So our gravity calculation didn't have extra scalar fields. And so we wanna work with a CFT where you don't have large one point functions. Um, Mark? Yep. How, how do the details of the boundary CFT enter or do they enter at all? Yeah. Like I would expect <clears throat> different boundary conditions to give you different answers. For example, having one point functions turned on and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That... <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, if I think about this, if I think about this boundary channel, um, so when you have a boundary CFT, um, there's a set of boundary operators, I mean, just like you have a, a set of bulk, local bulk operators, you have a set of um, boundary operators now. Um, and those operators are going to be different depending on which boundary you choose. And so in, the, in this boundary channel, when you, when you take a bulk operator, you can expand that in terms of boundary operators. It's kind of like the OPE, except it's just a bulk operator being expanded in boundary operators. And so that expansion is going to look different depending on which boundary condition you choose. Um, so for our specific calculation, the thing that comes in is this quantity called the boundary entropy. Um, and so, so that actually just a, basically it just appears in, in this boundary channel. Um, in, the, in the bulk channel, you don't see it. Um, so, so it's as expected, you know, it's just when you're expanding those bulk twist operators in terms of, um, in terms of the boundary fields, it's going to look different depending on which boundary um, condition you choose. Okay. So, um, anyways, the bottom line of all that is that I gave you kind of a, uh, a picture based on some bottom up gravity model that you might not have completely believed, but at least in 2d, we can do CFT calculations um, of entanglement entropy that are completely consistent with the answers about the, with, with the results of the gravity calculation that uses the details of the geometry, you know, both outside the horizon and behind the horizon. So, so it seems like at least in 2D, um, this picture stands up and, um, you, you know, including the dependence on including the fact that as, as you increase this boundary entropy, <clears throat> the end of the world brain gets further behind the horizon. <clears throat> and so it seems that by taking a large boundary entropy, you could actually have a brain that goes all the way over here and potentially localizes gravity. So I think it'd be very interesting to study these 2D models, um, just, just as examples, simple toy models of cosmology. And I should mention that kind of similar suggestions for how to get 2D cosmology have also been discussed recently um, in this SYK context by these people. But I wanna focus on 4D cosmology in this talk, in the rest of the talk. Um, and so let me review a, a kind of a puzzle that we found in our original paper um, when, when we try to do the gravity calculations in 4D. So in, in Sorry, going back in 2D, we had no problems um, sort of having the solutions that we require as you, as you take the tension to this critical value, this end of the world brain goes out and hugs the, or, uh, hugs the uh, boundary here uh, as we wanted to, it to. What about in 4D? Um, so it turns out that with the simplest bottom up model with just Einstein gravity and some tension parameter for our end of the world brain, we actually don't get the solutions that we want. 
So if you have a small value of the tension, then you have an end of the world brain that just divides the space in two, corresponds to the brain being right at the horizon at time zero. If you increase the tension, um, the brain goes further back. But that at some point, what happens in these Euclidean solutions as I move the, the brain further towards the second asymptotic boundary is that it overlaps itself. And, and so then the solution kind of fails to make sense. So while there are Lorentzian solutions with an end of the world brain as far back as we want, um, they don't seem to correspond to reasonable Euclidean solutions. So in terms of this picture of the two possible phases, what it suggests is if I make the tension parameter too large in the 4D case, it seems that we only have this phase that gives rise to pure ADS. The other solution doesn't seem to exist. And that's very confusing because remember this state corresponds to some very low energy state where the geometry looks like pure ADS. And this is kind of contrary to the expectation that these, um, these states I would get by taking T0 to zero, so, so what's called a boundary state um, the expectation is those are actually singular, actually infinite energy states when T0 goes to zero. So it's, it's a little bit confusing. And my feeling of this is that it's probably just a problem with our, our simple bottom-up model, that modeling the dual of these states with just Einstein gravity and some constant tension brain is just not an accurate model on the gravity side. Um, that is backed up by a study that Antonini and Swingle did after our first paper, where they looked at just enhancing the, the gravity model with an extra element, which is adding some charge to this end of the world brain. And they showed if you add a charge parameter and a gauge field in the bulk, um, then you can actually find solutions um, in, in both phases, even in this limit where tau zero goes to zero, um, regardless of the tension. So. So it seems like um, probably the issue is just with, with our, with our uh, simple bottom-up model and you know, maybe, maybe the whole, the general story could, could work. Um, and so that's now the plan for the rest of the talk is to talk about how, how can we come up with some microscopic construction you know, rather than having to rely on some bottom-up model and, and do gravity calculations. Can we actually find a microscopic construction um, of a state like this for a, for a 40 conformal field theory um, that would have all the properties that we want? Okay, so, so let me kind of just review the properties that we want. Um, so I, you know, I wanna be, be able to take this T0 parameter to be small and I want there to be I want the state to be in this phase where the end of the world brain connects. So let me actually describe that in field theory language. So in the limit where this T0 parameter becomes small, then the field theory is basically becoming a, a strip. I mean, you can, you, the, the T0 is much smaller than the radius of this. And so the physics in that limit is controlled by the physics of our field theory just on a strip where you have the boundary at future Euclidean time here and the boundary at past Euclidean time here. So these are now R3s and inside the strip, you have your 4D conformal field theory. Okay. Um, and so the, the two phases, remember, correspond to either the end of the world brain um, connecting up, that's what we wanted, or not connecting, and that was, that was the situation where you end up just getting pure ADS. So this is the, this is the one that's going to give the rise of the black hole with the end of the world brain behind the horizon. Okay. Um, so what do these gravity pictures correspond to in field theory language? So this is a 4D field theory, but we're, we're basically putting it on an interval and we're coupling it to these 3D field theories on either end of the interval. So at large distance scales, it just looks like a three dimensional field theory. And the question is basically, what's the infrared physics of this 3D field theory? Is it gapped or is it conformal? So the first case, which is the case we don't want, corresponds to a conformal field theory in the infrared. Okay. So we have a radial direction in the gravity picture that 
just keeps going. And if, if I zoom out on this picture, I just get kind of a wedge geometry, which is scale invariant. The situation that we want is where the brake connects up, then your radial direction is finite and below a certain scale, we don't have any degrees of freedom left. Okay. So in order to come up with a picture that gives rise to this, this cosmology situation, what I want to do is find some, start with some holographic 4D field theory um, and then choose some boundary conditions on either side where I have a lot of degrees of freedom in order to ultimately localize gravity on this end of the world brain, but also end up with a gap theory in the infrared rather than um, a conformal field theory in the infrared. Okay. Um, which 4D field theory should I start with? Well, I'm going to choose our favorite one, which is n equals four, super Yang Mills theory. And so I wanna tell you a little bit about boundary conditions for n equals four. I'm going to be focusing on boundary conditions that individually preserve supersymmetry. Later I'll break supersymmetry by adding two boundary conditions, but the kind of boundary conditions I'm going to be talking about are preserving supersymmetry um, they correspond to the low energy physics of semi-infinite D3 brains ending on stacks of D5s and NS5 brains. And we can add additional D3 brains between the five brains. So in the string theory picture, we actually ha have separate control over the number of bulk degrees of freedom and the number of boundary degrees of freedom. Okay, This brain configuration on its own without the semi-infinite brains, that that describe, is described at low energies by some 3D superconformal field theory. Okay, so you can think of the, the kind of theories I'm gonna be talking about are these, are they N equals four theory coupled to some 3D superconformal field theory. And these kinds of theories were described by Gallardo and Witten in, I think there's something like 370 pages that you can read all about them. Um, so, uh, so they're well understood. And what's even better is that for any one of these field theories, uh, the, the gravity dual is known. Okay, so these, these theories, uh, if you look at the, the vacuum state of any one of these theories coming from a brain configuration like this, you can look at these papers and they've constructed explicitly the gravity solution dual to each one of these theories uh, where, where the data from how of how many D5s and NS5s and D3s you have feeds into this gravity solution. So I want to review a little bit about what those solutions look like. The basic, you know, right, bottom line. What controls uh, C boundary? Yeah, C boundary is more or less controlled by the number of, of the brains, the comp how complicated this picture down here is. Okay, so if I add, if I add more D3 brains here between these um, five brains, I'm going to increase C boundary. Okay, so the actual degrees of freedom are, are coming from, from um, you know, three, three strings on these brains, or there's um, th strings between the three brains and the five brains. And so you, you can think of C boundary as just being like this, the central charge of, the, of some 3D superconformal field theory coming from this part of the brain construction. But C bulk does not bound C boundary. No, yeah, see, that's right. So because you can add an arbitrarily complicated um, 3D SCFT, C boundary over C bulk could be as large as you want. How does this arbitrarily complicated 3D SCFT couple, in fact, to the... <clears throat> so you can have... Is it to the D3? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a quiver gauge theory construction that... Um, You're talking about this T-S-U-N type theory? Yeah, exactly. These are like the T... SUN or there's, there's a generalization of that. Um, that well, that, that's the part that I'm trying to understand. The TSUN is one particular theory which has some fixed C boundary. So the- Yeah, so there's, there's a generalization of that which is like described by two Young diagrams, um, T rho, rho hat um, that Gayato and Witten discussed. And um, 
but but those are all so so generally speaking this part of it um you can understand as flowing but two from young the guy again is a finite list how is it that you get oh well the n okay so so the yeah but the um yeah i'm sorry so the you have to understand exactly what the constraints are. so the n parameter here from these d3 brains it's it's not the total number of boxes in these two young diagrams um, I mean, there's some, there's some negative signs. I see. It's, it's a I mean, it's much easier to understand just using the brain picture. Um, so the easiest way to present the data for this theory is just, is just, you know, precisely by saying how many of these D5 brains do you have between each pair of NS5s and how many D3 brains do you have? So that's one way of presenting the data. And, and so I just draw a, you know, a set of NS5 brains and then I give a set of numbers to say how many D3 brains are between each one, how many D5 brains. And there's some inequalities that those numbers have to satisfy in order to actually flow to some, um, some single uh, superconformal field theory in, in the infrared. Um, but those numbers are allowed, I can have as many NS5s as I want and I can add as many D3s as I want. Um, I thought the NS5s form a partition of the number of D3s. Aren't the NS5s bounded by the number of long D3s in the diagram? No, if you only, okay, if you only have NS5s or if you only have D5s, then what you're saying is true. And so that limited set of boundary conditions then are labeled by a partition of N, the number of D3 brains. Okay. So if, if you only but, have brains of the, one type, but these mixed ones are, are more complicated. Okay. Yeah. That's why it takes 370 pages to tell you all the details, but no, it's, I mean, this, this picture on the right is really the way you should think about the counting. Um, okay. So the, I mean, the, the basic story is that these, these theories are all dual to solutions of type 2b supergravity. And as I promised, they're kind, you can think of them as being ADS five times S five with an end of the world brain. Uh, let me, let me, Okay, I probably have time to, to just say a, a few details about these geometries. The symmetry preserved by adding the boundary condition is SO3 times SO3 times the SO3 two. So that's the bosonic symmetry. And that corresponds to the fact that these 2B solutions are ADS4 times S2 times S2. And that's sort of fibered over some quadrant, some, some Riemann surface, which you could think of as a quadrant of the plane. Um, the only thing, okay, so the only thing I want you to understand is that the data that specifies the supergravity solution is a set of numbers on the x-axis and on the y-axis. These are poles of some harmonic functions, and the harmonic functions, um, all the other metric and supergravity fields are expressed in terms of these harmonic functions. So the thing you need to understand is that I just pick a set of numbers here, L1 through LN and K1 through KM, and there's a mapping from that to a type 2B supergravity solution. These numbers are related to the numbers of brains here. Okay. So there's some field theory data that maps to this set of numbers here, and then this set of numbers maps to a supergravity solution. And the supergravity solutions are like asymptotically ADS5 times S5. What happens as you go further in here is that your internal space gets deformed from ADS5 and eventually it smoothly pinches off. Um, there are some interesting features associated with these poles, which are like NS5 and D5 brain throats. So there's some source of five brain flux inside. So there's some very complicated geometries, but they're known uh, completely explicitly. All right. Um, there's a large end limit in all of this somewhere. Yeah, I mean, for the for the gravity solution to be reliable, then n should be large. Is that the boundary or the bulk? Uh, I see. So here's the yeah here's the relevant formula. So the ADS radius is determined by this number n, which is equal to 
the sum of these numbers on the x-axis and the sum of the numbers on the y-axis. All right, this is the ADS-5 radius or the ADS-4? Yeah, this is the ADS-5 radius out here. Um, so if we, if we want this to be, if we, so, so the way I want to think about it is I want to choose some n to be large and that, that will be my, that will determine the, the bulk gauge group. Um, and I have a choice of boundary conditions. So the, all the possible boundary conditions I can choose um, correspond to the ways I could choose numbers that add up to n. In supergravity, there's no constraint on those numbers, so I could just choose anything. In string theory, there's some, the flux quantization conditions give you some specific um, constraints on these numbers, and so there, there's actually a discrete set that are allowed. Um, but you, have, you still have an infinite number of choices, and these choices correspond to the, that infinite number of possible brain constructions. Okay, so here, here, so here's the kind of important, one important thing is that um, we wanted to get an end of the world brain that localizes gravity. And it turns out there's a way to do that within this construction. And so you do this. Okay, so this is going back and forth. Um, what you end up wanting to do is to take these poles down near the origin keeping n fixed. So I just, I just add more poles and I just make sure they continue to add up to n. And what happens in this limit, if, if all my x-axis poles and y-axis poles go down to zero, um, my geometry actually goes right over to pure ADS5 times S5. Okay, so there's actually a limit within supergravity of these end of the world brain, these end of the world brain geometries, where I recover the entirety of ADS five times S five. In string theory, there's some constraints, um, and so so I can still take this end of the world brain to be at an angle which is almost pi over two, um, and that's kind of what we want for our construction. Okay, so so within this class of boundary conditions for n equals four, I can act. It's, it's quite interesting that I could add some 3D superconformal field theory on the boundary of n equals four and a half space and then recover almost all of the physics of the full ADS5 times S5. Okay, okay. so that's, that's the kind of boundary condition I wanna consider. Having lots of poles way down here, remember basically each pole corresponds to a five brain. And so taking a very large number of poles with very small values of K and L corresponds to having a large number of five brains in my field theory construction. And that corresponds to having a large amount of, of uh, this boundary entropy. And in what sense is gravity localized? So, th so then that's, that's sort of appealing to the randall sundram analysis. So once I realized that I have an end of the world brain, which is, which is out um, near the boundary of ADS five times S five, um, then I, you know, then I apply the previous analysis to say, to say that for such a brain, um, the bulk graviton is going to have a mode that behaves like um, a 40 graviton. But um, you said that, that there are some explicitly known supergravity solution in these models? Yes. Have people studied the, um, uh, the, uh, wave functions of linearized perturbations? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think they've done that. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the solutions are, or this limit is sort of new. Um, or we, we realized that you could take this limit. Um, you know, I think that a way to understand this, <clears throat> so, so how is it that we're able to, actually, let me, let me go to the next slide and I'll give you, you sort of a separate argument for, for, um, for why we might expect um, to get this localized graviton. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, okay. So let me postpone that for a moment. Um, so just to remind you what our, what our job was, we wanted to start with a 40 theory and then actually we wanted to add two boundaries, not just one boundary. And we wanted to 
ask whether we could find a situation where you have a large number of degrees of freedom so that you have this Planck brain, but it also connects up in the infrared. Okay, so. Yeah, I think part of the reason I'm confused is, yeah. uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, ordinarily you would say that in the field theory, it's sort of the stress tensor is dual to the graviton. So um, you would want a CFT so that, you know, that st stress tensor reflects some large number of degrees of freedom. On the other hand, you're trying to mass up the boundary theory, which indicates that actually at low energies, there isn't anything there anymore. So they're sort of working at odds to one another. Right. So, so far, let's not think about the, let's think about the UV. Okay. So, so here's a different way to understand this thing. Um, the limit I'm taking has a very large number of degrees of freedom here. We could start by thinking about that theory on its own without the N equals four theory. That theory on its own has a gravity dual, which is, which is some 4D gravity theory. I mean, of course, there's internal dimensions as well. Um, but if I just had the 3D superconformal field theory, which I'm free to do if I want, I could decouple those D3 brains. That would be just a 3D holographic theory. And we would say there's, there's a 4D gravity dual. And now we add back in the higher dimensional brains. And the intuition is that if this is a much smaller number of brains than the number down here, so if I just put one D3 brain or two or four, um, then I would expect that would sort of be a small perturbation on, on the physics so that approximately on the gravity side, I still have a 4D gravity theory, but now that, you know, it's not, it's not exactly a 4D gravity theory anymore. So that's kind of like the Planck, the Randall syndrome picture where approximately I have this, this lower dimensional gravity theory, but then you have some effects coming in of, of you know, the possibility of, of um, excitations leaking into the bulk. And then when I, when I go to this higher, when I go to the situation with the two boundaries, um, let me just jump ahead. Um, I mean, regardless of whether the brain connects up or doesn't connect up, um, there's still a brain here. So, so we can still have gravity localized in this region. And there's a, sort of a separate question whether it continues to be localized over here. Right. Um, but okay, let's not jump ahead too much. Okay, I'm almost done. So hopefully it's hopefully it's okay. Um, so so we want to add the second boundary, and we could do this in two ways. In this picture, I've got a completely supersymmetric situation where I take the orientations of the NS fives and D fives to be the same everywhere. In the infrared, if I if I held the length of these D3 brains fixed, I would end up with a superconformal. Well, I would end up with this theory with n equals four coupled to su two superconformal theories, and then um, in the far infrared, this would be dual. This would just correspond to a single superconformal field, field theory. So this would this flows down in the infrared to the theory I get just by making all of those D3 brains short. There's some very specific um, theory that that corresponds to just the whole brain construction, ignoring the lengths of these D3 brains. Um, and so in this supersymmetric case, I actually end up with this kind of a picture where um, in the UV, I have a little bit of ADS, asymptotically ADS5 times S5 space, and then there's this end of the world brain, and, um, and the, the brains don't connect up. So I just have, it's almost like I still have two decoupled superconformal field theories um, that, that just you know, become coupled to each other in the infrared um, through, through a, f a few degrees of freedom here. Okay. Um, but what we really wanted to do in our construction, remember this picture was coming from some Euclidean path integral where I had a bra and a cat. And so I wanted to reverse the orientation. So I wanted to define this one by a reflection of this one. 
And that changes the orientation of the D5 brains and the NS5 brains in our picture. And so actually, instead of, instead of the picture on the previous slide, what I really have is, um, is anti-brains up here or down here and brains up here. So, so the actual thing we want to consider is a supersymmetry breaking situation where you have your n equals four, it's on an interval, and you have boundary conditions that together break supersymmetry. Okay. Now, the conjecture is that this non-supersymmetric situation is just going to flow down to uh, a gap theory. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of evidence for that. Um, but but I don't have a I don't have a proof. So I want to think about this situation. Um, you know, it's it's similar to the situation that Witten studied when he was trying to define confining gauge theory in ADS CFT, where you take a conformal field theory, you put it on a circle with anti-periodic boundary conditions for fermions. So you have supersymmetry breaking boundary conditions, and the gravity dual of that situation had the circle contracting in the bulk. And so, um, so the low energy physics is, is gapped. So here, instead of a circle with supersymmetry breaking boundary conditions, I have an interval with supersymmetry breaking boundary conditions. And again, what I'm hoping to see is that this interval contracts in the bulk. So the interval contracts so that I end up, um, I end up with a gap theory. There's a probe version of this thing uh, where, where what I'm talking about definitely happens. So instead of having D3 brains stretched between five brains, I could just think of the five brains as being probes and either have the supersymmetric configuration where I have two D5s or the non-supersymmetric configuration where I have a D5 and anti-D5. In this probe situation, I have these defects in my N equals four theory, um, either with the same or opposite orientation. And the gravity dual um, people here realize that in the supersymmetric case, you would just have two parallel probe D5 brains. But in the, in the supersymmetry breaking case, you end up with a configuration where these defects join together. And so in this case, if you just thought about the physics associated with these defects, um, that, would be, that would be gapped. Okay, so now I'm trying to, ex ex I want to extrapolate this to the case where I don't just have one D5, I have lots of them and they actually end the D3 brains. Um, and so again, I don't have a, I don't have a, a detailed argument, um, but what I, would, what, what I would like to happen is for the probe case to carry over into this, into this situation where with the supersymmetry breaking situation, we end up with a conformal field theory in the infrared, but in the supersymmetry breaking situation, these end of the world brains join up. Okay. Now, the way to tell for sure would actually be just to analyze type 2b supergravity equations. So we know the asymptotic geometry for the theory that I'm describing. Um, so, so in this region here, it should look like one of these supersymmetric geometries for the n equals 4 with a single boundary. And down here, it should look like a similar geometry with where the boundary has, um, the boundary theory has the opposite orientation. And then here it's just asymptotically ADS5 times S5. So in principle, what we want to do is study these supergravity equations and see what solutions there are with these boundary conditions and ask, is there a connected, is there a solution where the end of the world brain is connected? Is that the least action solution? And then, you know, finally, if, if, uh, if it is connected, well, we, we kind of argued that gravity is, is, is localized here um, near, near the UV. Does it sort of continue to be localized everywhere along this end of the world brain? Okay. Um, so, so that's kind of the current situation. I think it's sort of, I feel like it's plausible that there's some way of making choices here where you would get a, confine, uh, a gap theory in the infrared. I mean, if... It actually seems gen almost generic to me that um, you choose some 4D conformal field theory here that's holographic, and then you, you put um, boundary conditions here and boundary degrees of freedom, 
and, and break supersymmetry, um, it would be surprising to me if every way that you could do that, you always end up with a conformal field theory in the infrared. Um, I guess my, my intuition would be in a lot of cases that you would end up with a gap theory in, in the infrared. And so it almost it seems like the situation that we want is, is kind of generic. But it's a little bit puzzling. If that's true, it's a little bit puzzling. Um, and this, this is, came from conversations with uh, Henry Lin and, and Juan Maldacena, um, because it's, it's a little bit difficult to understand. Um, so they've tried to, they've tried to understand um, situations like this. So you know, notice this Euclidean picture is it's it's kind of like in the effective description if. If gravity is localized, this is kind of like a Euclidean wormhole with asymptotically um, ADS4 here and here and then connected in the bulk. Okay. So, um, so if, if, if all of this is true, then the effective, and gravity is localized here, then the effective description uh, um, in the Euclidean gravity picture would be, would be like some ADS4 Euclidean wormhole. And, um, and Maldacena and others have have been trying various constructions to to construct these wormholes, um, and it's not particularly easy. Um, so there are some constructions of of wormholes, um, but it's it seems quite difficult to actually come up with them. And so, if there are all these solutions, like I'm suggesting, um, it'd be interesting to understand how, what is what is the physics in the effective description? What, what kind of effective field theory actually leads to these Euclidean wormholes? Um, yeah, I think that's, okay. I think that's basically the, the story, so thanks. Okay, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> um, okay, there was already a lot of questions, but uh, we can take a five minute break and come back for discussions, does that sound good? Okay, sounds good. Right, great, thank you again, Mark.